as the world went, it was unable, it was impossible for me to continue in that line for reasons I can't go into here. But, you know, Srila Sridhar sometimes talks about Sri Aurobindo, who was a freedom fighter in the early days of Indian independence, when their battle cry was Vande Matara, which means glories to the motherland. And he had this idea that maybe some of his men could take sannyas provisionally for like six years and then after six years retire it and go back to their ordinary business. So I, I maintained my sannyas vows very carefully for about seven years but after that it, it, for different reasons I can't get into it but it was time for me to move on and do something else so I established myself in in Mexico is a university teacher and that's the platform that I use now of course now everything is virtual but back in the day they used to call me Maharaj and it's nice it's music to your ears it's good for your ego it makes that black box bigger <laughs> <laughs> ah, Maharaj, <that's> me. <laughs> it's actually better to stay away from too much praise and uh, he's filling my ears with all this high praise, but it's not really so good for that black box in there. So I have to figure out a way to diminish that. Madhusudan and Maharaj is very good at avoiding any kind of praise. He's very humble. He doesn't like it. He'll just cut you right there and stop you. But I don't cut you because I'm trying to be polite. You know, you're giving a nice speech and it makes you happy. So I'm not going to stop you, but thank you very much for the beautiful introduction. What he's saying is true. It's a miracle that I'm here. It wasn't really my intention, uh, but Pranashish Chalans, we worked together on a nice translation of Prapanachivanamrita, a poetic translation of which there are only 100 copies. And, uh, Gopishwar Prabhu has one. Uh, our other books are available out here if you haven't read uh, Sri Guru and His Grace. It comes highly recommended. If you're interested in understanding the position of Guru, he mentioned Nityananda. The other day was Balaram's appearance day. How is it possible that God has all these different manifestations? People criticize India. Oh, you Hindus have 10,000 gods, how is it possible? But we understand from the uh, Upanishad, it says, Om Purnam Adha Purnam Idam, Purnat Purnam Udachate, Purnasyan Purnam Adaya, Purnam Eva Vashishite. You hear the word Purnam, it means complete. So the complete whole, Prabhupada translated it like that. Srila Sri Ramas likes the infinite. So he says, infinite divided by infinite is still infinite. Strange. It's a mathematical impossible number, the infinite. It can't be divided. But if you were to divide the infinite by the infinite, it would still be infinite. That's what the Upanishads say, and they're thousands of years old. So, so if you take the, the infinite absolute, of course in Christianity we know that God has only one son. But well, okay. okay. He's, right. he's, okay. he's, okay. he's guest. Do me on the guest. Yes, he's guest. I should have gone to Maharaj Ki Jai. Okay. I should have. And people are very jealous, Sorry. thinking, Sorry. well, oh, God only has one son. But uh, I know people in Mexico who have 12, 15 children. So if they can have more than one son, why not God? God, in fact, can have infinite sons. Only we don't call them sons so much. We like the word avatar. And the first vamsha or expansion of God is Balaram. And the, what's his purpose? 
course, God doesn't need a purpose. He's buying for himself. But if there's a difference in purpose between Krishna and Balaram, what is, who is Krishna? Krishna means he's the absolute enjoyer. He's only having fun. He's only enjoying himself. He has no other business. How do you know he's God? That's the proof. He has no other business but to enjoy. Every other god in the pantheon of gods has a job. Vayu moves the wind. Uh, Indra brings the rain. Brahma creates the universe. Shiva destroys. What does Krishna do? Nothing. Well, not nothing. That would be Buddhist. Right? If Krishna did nothing. But he's dancing with the gopis. That's his job. He's enjoying himself in Vrindavan. That's his job. So it's no job at all. Krishna doesn't work. He does no work at all. But he has a brother, Balaram, to take care of the work. So Balaram is also Sankarshan, another name according to uh, Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami. You'll find this explanation in the Chaitanya Charitamrita Adi Leela, the very first part of it, that uh, God expands himself. First expansion is Balaram. And Balaram takes care of everything else, the whole environment. So, if you think about the idea of God revealing himself, it's an interesting concept because we think of revealed knowledge. How do I know God? How do I know God exists? If I talk to the universe, the universe doesn't talk back to me, does it? But then again, yes it does. If you sit quietly, you'll hear the sound OM, the universal sound. So God is talking back to you, OM, it is. What you're thinking, does God exist? Yes. Srila Sri Ramaraj used to say OM means a big yes. Yes, it's real. Yes, it exists. What you're hoping for, what you're trying for, that eternal life. Yes, it's there. So the, the universe talks back to us. God talks back to us in the form of divine sound. Om is sort of a primitive kind of mantra. The Hare Krishna mantra is a perfect mantra. But more than that, uh, God also appears. Krishna says, Samavami yuge yuge. I come from yada yada hi dharma syat. You know, Sambhavami Yuga Yuga. I come from time to time to reestablish Dharma when people forgot. So you can think, oh, well, that's only once in a millennium. You know, Krishna came 5,000 years ago. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came 500 years ago. But Balaram, Nityananda Prabhu, comes also in the form of the Guru. And the Guru reveals Krishna to us. So all these different manifestations of Balaram, the, the guru is the kindest because we get Krishna through him. And this is explained in that book, Sri Guru and His Grace, which you can get on the counter out there. So, you know, I highly recommend anyone who hasn't gone through that, go through that book and you'll find a very, very deep and profound explanation of the nature of Guru, how he manifests in this world. Uh, he says, uh, to err is human. To err is natural. We're imperfect by nature. And yet, the human form of life lends itself towards the search for Sri Krishna. Tato Brahma Jigyasa, the Vedanta says, search for truth, search for reality search for the spiritual science, Brahma, God, trying to find God. Srila Sridhar says, that's superficial. Uh, he says, I talk to Krishna Jigyasa. Now is the time to search for Krishna because you were born for that. You were born to find your immortal nature. So, Search for Amrita, nectar. He quotes the Vedas. Shrinbantu Vishve Amritasya Putra. Your sons of nectar. 
You were born for nectar. You're not made really for anything else but nectar. It's an interesting word in Sanskrit, amrita. And it sort of translates immortal. And it's interesting in language, the word mort, muerte, uh, mrityu, means death. And amrityu means the opposite of death. Immortal means non-death. But it's one thing to talk about eternal life as being the opposite of death. But what does that give you? It's not a very deep idea. Non-death, what does it mean? So for the Buddhists, that's nirvana. Non-death, nirvana, nowhere. But that's not really what we're going for. Chakracharya turned out its, on its head. The Buddhists like the idea of zero, nothing, nirvana. Chakracharya said, no, no, we're not doing nothing. We're doing infinite. Apparently, they're the same. Zero divided by zero is zero. Zero times zero is zero. But would you prefer zero or the infinite? So Shankar is promising the infinite. But Srila Sridhar goes beyond that. He says Amrita then should be immortality. But we, we don't want something negative like non-death. We want positive immortality. And it should be progressive. So Rupa Goswami's divine uh, positive and progressive immortality is having a kind of relationship with God. And he says, this is possible. You can have a loving relationship with God. How that unfolds? Well, you can come into the Sangha, talk to uh, Gopishwar, read the books, and chant the Hare Krishna mantra, because all of these teachings, strangely enough, all of these teachings are found within the mantra. As you, as he said, he's been chanting the mantra for 40 years. But there's a superficial reading of the mantra. This is good for me, it relaxes my mind, it gives me peace, it takes me away from the hustle and bustle of, of this world. But as you continue to chant, you'll go more deeply into the mantra and begin to realize this has sort of a personal nature to it. The teachings of Sri Chaitanya unlock the secrets of the mantra. Uh, also through the teachings of the books, the Sangha, you know, following certain very simple concepts of human life, like non-violence. For example, the devotees of Krishna, we don't eat animals. That's killing. Even in the Bible it says, thou shalt not kill. So you can't stand before God with blood on your hands. It's just not a healthy concept. Well, on the other hand, we're not vegans, right? Because Krishna loves milk. We offer food to Krishna first for his enjoyment, and then we can partake of that. That's called prasadam, his grace. And Krishna is very generous. He, in the Bhagavad Gita, he says, Pachapushpam Palam Payam. You can offer me a fruit, a flower, a little water, a leaf. So he's not jealous like other gods who say, sacrifice your, your son. I want you to bring your son and, to me on an altar and, and kill him and sacrifice him as a uh, god to, of the, the Jehovah God of the, of the Old Testament told Abraham. Of course, later on, he, he, he lets Abraham off the hook and he says, oh, okay, you don't really have to do that. But at some point, he's asking for that kind of sacrifice. The ancient Aztecs would uh, cut out the heart of a volunteer and offer the smoking heart to the sun, and saying, please, sun, please don't go down forever. Come up tomorrow. We need you. We offer you the smoking heart of this young man. But Krishna's not like that. He's, he doesn't say, uh, sacrifice a lamb, sacrifice a heart. He says, just a little fruit, a little flower. I don't need much. I'm God, I have everything. What can you give me that I, you know, 
it's Christmas time, you want to get something, or you know, your anniversary, you want to buy something for your husband or birthday. You think, well, what can I, what can I get? Kumari's got everything, you know. But what about Krishna? What can you offer Krishna? He's got everything. He says, it doesn't matter. But with some love, do it with some love. And then, I'm yours. You know, so, a little bit of sacrifice, um, but not of the animal kind. You know, very simple rules and regulations for yoga life. Don't eat animals. You can have ice cream. You can have yogurt, you know, fruit, uh, milk. Milk products are nice, you know, ch cheese. Srila Prabhupada, when he initiated us, he said, follow these four principles and chant Hare Krishna. No meat eating, uh, no intoxication. Don't, don't make yourself crazy. We're already so crazy. We have so many things to drive us completely crazy. Even without alcohol or I don't know what the popular drugs are to take today. Uh, our mind is so disturbed by the three modes of material nature, sattva, rajas, and tamas. It makes us completely crazy. Crazy in what sense? I've forgotten that I am eternal soul, I'm Atma. And I think I'm this, I'm a white man, I'm an American, I speak with an American accent, um, I'm old, this is who I am, this is my identity. People talk a lot about identity and identity politics, but your identity is Atma. Everything else is a hunger, it's, it's ego. But it's difficult to remember that because our mind is so crazy with so many toxic things, so don't <clears throat> intoxicate yourself. No immediately, no intoxication. Then he says, uh, sex life? If you must take a wife, take a wife for life. Be faithful, honor her. Don't betray her. Otherwise, there's so much lust in this world. It's just another way of making you crazy and increasing the black box of the ego. <clears throat> Buddha says, okay, destroy the ego. Just the joke about the Buddhist doctor. You know the joke. The man has a headache. No, boy has a headache. His mother takes him to different doctors. They say, well, he has a migraine. Yeah, I know that. But can you give him something? Um, well, we tried, but you know, take take this medicine. Doesn't work. So finally, somebody tells her, you could try the Buddhist doctor. So she goes to the Buddhist doctor. Can you help my boy? Uh, possibly. I think so. Yeah, I'll take on his case. Um, go take a walk in the park. It'll take me some time. So she takes a nice walk in the park and sees the birds and the bees and everything is beautiful. There's the Irish, you know, stream running under the bridge and the swans and it's a beautiful summer day. She comes home, goes to see the doctor. And my boy? Uh, yes, I think the, product, the process has worked. You mean his headache is gone? Yes, you may see him. She opens the door and goes in the next room. He's lied. Laying out on a table, cold, he's dead. Cold and stiff. She says, my boy, what have you done? He's dead. And the doctor says, hmm, yes, that's a minor complication. But, <laughs> of course, his headache is gone. <laughs> so, you know, not to run down the Buddhist, but the solution to the ego there is this complete destruction of the ego. But this is a very hard road, and it's very difficult, nearly impossible, because the ego will come out somehow. Uh, in Krishna consciousness, we think that the ego has a higher purpose in the service of Krishna, in the service of God. So God himself, we can't know. It's very difficult to know him. But we can know him through the representative of divinity. And as we were saying before, 
God appears in different ways, avatars, as the guru, even as Vaishnavas. So try to do some service to the, to the devotees. You can see divinity coming through them. Give them some service, bring them a flower, you know, encourage their Krishna bhakti. So we did meat eating, intoxication, sex. Keep it under control. You know, and gambling. gambling. Gambling is another thing that agitates the mind. So he mentioned the fact that I read a lot of books. Don't read a lot of books. <laughs> It's very bad. <laughs> Books are dangerous. Books are very dangerous. I was given some sort of special, I like to believe, I was given some sort of special <laughs> dispensation, you know, to read books because Srila Sri Ramaj would say, uh, Vedantic concept of subjective evolution of consciousness has a lot to do with Berkeleyan idealism, even Hegelian idealism. You can find it in Phenomenology of the Spirit. Um, also, you can understand the, the progression of consciousness from Anandamoy, Pranamoy, you know, Manamoy, Gyanamoy, Vidyanamoy, Anandamoy. That's given by Bhaktivinoda Thakur and Chaitanya Shikshamrita and Krishna Sanghita. Okay, so now I have a list of books that I have to read so that I can understand what Sri Ramarsh is saying because I'm trying to edit his work and make it clear to the average person. So I'm thinking, well, do I really have to read the Phenomenology of the Spirit by Hegel? It's like that. But, okay, I went through that. You know, Hegel says, die to live. Now, Sri Ramarsh is one of his favorite things to say when we were there. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he preached that in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s. But in the 80s, he was saying, die to live. Because in order to live in the higher realm of positive and progressive immortality, Amrita, you have to die to this world. You have to surrender. Die to live is a code word for surrender, prapana, prapati. South India, or Sharnagati in Bengal, the path of surrender. So, in order to understand all these different ideas, we have these books, I worked very hard on them, read them, profit by them, try to circulate them. Uh, I was very surprised because I worked very hard. Some six years of intensive work to publish five titles, and a couple of more years uh, to make those books in the 1980s. And I'm told, I don't believe it, but people tell me the 1980s was 40 years ago. What? How is that possible? Because I feel like Sri Maharaj is in India with Govinda Maharaj <laughs> sitting, discussing, you know, Ahamved me, Shukoveti, Yasaveti, Naveetiva. Lord Shiva says, I know the purport of the Bhagavatam. Shukadev knows. Yasadev, who wrote the book, he may or may not know. And he's there in India doing that while I'm sitting here talking. But people tell me, no, Maharaj, it's not true. They're not here anymore. You know, pay attention to the present. So. So from in the 1990s, we found that nobody read those books. Uh, they were interested in making money and uh, working hard. And in the 2000s also. And suddenly I got a call from somebody in Thailand, Bhakti Sudhir Goswami. And he said, no, we're doing it. I went to Thailand to his ashram there and met with Bhakti Bhima Avadut Maharaj, and he told me, oh, we're printing thousands of copies of the search for Sri Krishna. We need a better exp explanation of subjective evolution because it's a difficult book. People don't really understand Berkeley and idealism. And I'm thinking, well, I, I studied that. Maybe I can explain that. I can help you. 
Ah, yes, come to Russia. I went to Russia and Ukraine, and the Russian devotees, they love the Ukrainian devotees. The Ukrainian devotees, they love the Russian devotees. Everybody's chanting Hare Krishna. It's the international Krishna movement that I knew and loved when I met him, you know, or didn't, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like 40 years ago. When we were in this con, it was the international society. There were black people, white people, African, Japanese, Chinese, Indian, and we all had this idea that God is not a, a nationalistic concept. It's not a, you know, it's not a question of man, woman, black, white, any of that. It's a universal truth. Like he said, well, probably my disciples are different. Maybe that's why. We don't believe in all this, you know, identity, nationalistic stuff. We're trying for the higher ideal. So, I got off my point, but, uh, oh, so in Russia, I saw they have these books. I'm amazed. They gave me some, and I, I'm flying out of uh, Moscow. And I saw there's a girl. She started talking to me. Oh, yeah, you yoga? Really? I gave her a book. And then uh, I saw her again in Frankfurt. And she said, oh, I read that book. That was really good. I said, oh, you keep that. I wanted to keep that to go back to the United States. Look, there it is in Russian. But I found, I have to give it to her. And I thought, wow, here I am 35 years later doing book distribution. <laughs> it's in a weird airport, you know, in the world somewhere. But from that, I, I heard this expression, the child is the father of the man. I don't know where that comes from. I heard it somewhere. And I never really understood that. What's that supposed to mean, the child is the father of the man? It's a paradox, isn't it? But what I thought was, I produced those, I didn't write those books, that's true, let's read on us, but we produced those books. We put together a team, we worked very hard for six years. We had to get the money for the press, for the printing, all that, put together. Uh, but I did that in a very determined way, thinking, one day I'm going to need to read this book. Right now I'm, I'm in it, I'm, I'm in the current, I'm absorbed, I'm flowing with it. But the time will come when maybe I'm an old man and these teachings are not in my heart as deeply as they are now as a young man. What will I do then? Well, then I can read this book. But it never crossed my mind that there would also be people to teach the book back to me in my old age. So the child is the father of the man. The young people today, the generation today, they have this book in their hand and they're coming to me and they're saying, it says this and this and this. And I'm like, oh yeah, it does. That is mm -hmm. there. He said, yes, oh, it is. You know? Wow. And there, now some Russians are teaching that back to me, you know? <laughs> These little kids are, you know, 21, 22, 20, these are shining faces. And they're showing it to me on their cell phones. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it occurred to me, you know, the child is the father of the man. So, you know, Gopishwar himself and, you know, myself, in part, we feel indebted to our Guru Dave, who gave us something, gave us the most valuable treasure we have in our life. And the only way we can keep that treasure, strangely, is to give it away. And if, if we're successful in giving that treasure away to others, then suddenly it comes back to us. And then we have the mercy again. Abhidut Marsh turned to me once and he said, you got a lot of mercy from Sri Dharma. And I thought, maybe, I'm not sure about that, but you know, if somebody asks me for the mercy, like, you know, is that my position? Can I give any mercy to anybody? I don't think so, but, you know, I'll try. And if it works, sometimes it does, then I find that the mercy comes back to me and I'm renewed. So I had no reason to come to Ireland at all. But I thought, you owe it to yourself to take a pilgrimage to see where the holy name is. And I can't make it to India, it's too expensive. But I can come to a place 
where the holy name of Krishna is alive in the hearts and minds of some Irish folk. And I will see, I told you that, right? Mm -hmm. I, I will see, how is that living there? And what can it teach me? I, I want to walk on the path and find some other pilgrims and see where is the holy name in their heart. And maybe they're further down the path and say, come on, come on, it's not so far. Come on, you can do it. Or, you know, maybe they're a little bit behind me and I can say, uh, Obishwar told me, yeah, it's this way, come on, we're all going there. And um, so this fellowship of the holy name, this Sangha, uh, even though we're in some remote corner of Ireland called Limerick, far from Navarikdam, far from Vrindavan, far from the spiritual sky of Vaikuntha, but still, the holy name is living in your heart, and your heart, and your heart, and your heart, and we try to keep it alive. Like he said, uh, we're all sparks. Maybe we're not the sun. Maybe Srila Prabhupada was the sun. Maybe it was Sri Dharmaj. Maybe Govindavaraj was the moon. We have stars like Madhusudan Maharaj. We're lucky for that. Tomorrow or the next day, I don't remember, we're celebrating his, uh, his birthday. Monday. Monday. Yeah. Yeah. But as sparks, we can all, a spark is not the same as a star. It doesn't give very much light, but it gives you a little heat. And if you bring it together, you can make a fire and you've got heat and light. And it's nice and warm. We can warm ourselves with that fire and get some light. So that's the purpose of the the sangam. So we're asking all of you. We're not asking you to give money or build a temple or create some great huge project with machines and smoke and light and mirrors. We're just asking you to carry the holy name of Krishna in your heart and keep it with you. And from time to time, come together in this Sangha with uh, Gopishwar and uh, the other good folks here in Ireland, Somashan. And uh, that's all I can say. I don't want to take much of your time. I, did, I wasn't prepared for a talk, but your, ins your introduction forced me to say something. So thank you so much all for Hare Krishna. I'm sure Gopishwar probably has a better message than I do, but that's all I can say. That's very perfect. Anybody can ask a question if they like. Any question? Are you sure? I'll take questions. I like questions. I don't like to. I really don't like to speak formally so much. I'm a, I'm a teacher, you know, a professor, and what I find. The best is to give my students a project and see how they do with it, you know, and then not put myself in the center so much, but I try to put what we're studying in the center, because that's how we teach now. But sometimes the folks like a straight talk, so I gave you some straight talk. Yeah. I'll take any. Anybody have any questions? If not, I'm I'm free to go. <laughs> Time for you to. Do you want to take the shuttle now? Yeah, we'll start with the shuttle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. All right. So we just finished the last. Hurry, hurry. Jadu Gopal. Need hurry, hurry. Okay. Thank you.